Thank you, Jason. Uh, thanks, everyone. I want to say thank you to Rajam as well for inviting me to come here. So I get to come to San Diego from very cold, wet London. I call it work, which is a, a, a fantastic thing. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today um, about something that I think is really important but often gets crowded out in discussions about treatments, uh, and that is how we determine effectiveness of, of our treatments and some of the challenges that are currently sort of going on around that area. Um, feel free at the Q&A to tell me I'm wrong about anything. I'm quite happy to be wrong about things. I'm going to start uh, just by going through my declarations of interest. This is something that's usually rushed, but actually, when we talk about effectiveness evidence, if you think about it, we're all vested, powerfully vested. We all have these interests, so, uh, so it's important to go through them. So I'm a, a lecturer in physiotherapy at Bruno University, and that's where I draw my salary. Um, I'm a senior editor for Body and Mind, the blog. Put your hand up if you read Body and Mind. Don't be polite if you don't. For those of you who don't have your hand up, go on, read Body and Mind. Um, I'm on the editorial board of the Cochrane Pain Palliative and Supportive Care Group. Uh, I worked recently with uh, NICE, the clinical guidelines uh, producer in the UK, on the recent uh, guideline for low back pain, which you may have seen. And I've received speakers' fees over the years from all of these organizations, and I receive payment from time to time for running workshops that help clinicians work out how better to read a paper. So they're my interests. So let's get into, into uh, the, the meat of the topic now. Sometimes I think to myself, why do I even need to think about evidence? Because, you know, all I have to do is consult Google to realize that persistent pain has already been cured, and it's already been cured about a thousand times, right? I think. I think my favorite one of these is this one here. This is a subliminal CD. I, I imagine these days you can just download it from iTunes. And uh, you plug it in and you go to sleep. And when you wake up, your back pain is cured. It's fantastic, right? So, so there's so much hope out there. But imagine being the person with persistent pain who's trying to find answers. So you start to Google and you find these things, the back knobber, the fibromyalgia cure in just three easy steps. I must have wasted a lot of time in my career. The seven day back pain cure. How do you make sense of that claim and counter claim? But the thing about that is, this industry isn't an industry filled full of people with bad intentions, filled full of charlatans. It's an industry filled with people who all have the best intentions. Well, maybe not all, but I think most of us have the best intentions. We passionately believe in the training that we've had. We passionately feel that we are seeing improvement in our patients and that we are driving that change. And it's probably best summed up by this quote from the medical philosopher and biologist from years ago, Sir Peter Medawar, which is that the exaggerated claims for the effectiveness of a treatment are usually the outcome of a kindly conspiracy in which everybody has the best intentions. The patient wants to be made well. The therapist wants to have it in their power to make that person well. And the industry generating the health technologies that allow them to do that want to create the technologies that allow people to get well. And so what we have is a conspiracy of goodwill that makes us perhaps feel that we're effective more often than we are. What Peter Medawar went on to say was the controlled clinical trial, which is the source of evidence that I'm going to talk about largely today, is an attempt to avoid being taken in by that conspiracy of goodwill. The good news for us when we're working in, in persistent pain is that we have an explosion of evidence from clinical trials and systematic reviews. Uh, are you all familiar with the Pedro database? So this is a, a database generated by some fantastic people at the University of Sydney. And it basically is a repository of all clinical trials and systematic reviews that pertain to physical therapy treatments. And you can see over the years how the number of clinical trials in that database has exploded. Even better news for those of us working in pain is that the majority of them are in our field. They're in the area of musculoskeletal care. And that would largely include all the trials of people with persistent pain. But they're not all good trials. So the Pedro database has developed a scoring system to rate the quality of an RCT, of a, of a clinical trial. And by quality, we're talking about the risk of bias within that trial. 
And the maximum score on the Pedro scale there is a score out of 10. And if we have a look at the distribution of uh, scores of, of trials in the, in the Pedro database, we see that on average they're scoring about 5 out of 10. So on about half of the items that we think would make a good, robust clinical trial, the average trial in the database is falling down. Now, there are some of those that we're all aware that are unavoidable. For most of our interventions, it's not possible for us to really blind patients to the treatment that they're receiving, and it's not possible for us to blind the therapist either. So there's two points dropped. But there are still biases in there that we should be routinely controlling for in our trials, and we're not. And if we have a look at which percentage of trial fulfilled all the criteria, then we can see that a number of trials are not uh, delivering concealed allocation. This is a process by which the person who randomizes people to treatments is completely removed from the process of meeting and greeting people into the trial. Because if they're not part of the human condition, people cheat. And we know that trials that don't report concealed allocation, even if they report that they randomized, deliver systematically larger treatment effects than trials that did. So that's something we're falling down on. We're not routinely using intention to treat analysis. And without getting technical, that's just about the fairest and most robust way of analyzing data from people who withdrew from the trial and withdrew from the treatment. So we've got a large number of studies in physiotherapy literature that are essentially employing analyses that are biased and largely biased towards exaggerating the effectiveness of the treatment. So it's good news and bad news, right? We've got loads of trials, that evidence base is growing, but we've got some problems. Are things improving? Well, kind of, if we look at how scores have gone. But let's be fair, we're not improving at a pace. Now, it's interesting to think about what that means. What I've noticed in the last 10 years is that we are really starting to see large, well-conducted, well-conceived clinical trials in rehab. And these trials are a new thing. They are definitely uh, representing an increase in the quality of the data that we have. But we still have a growing number of very small, very loose, very amateurish trials that are making their way into the literature. And that kind of pollutes things for us. And it makes it harder for us to make sense of it. Oh, my snail's actually gone completely off the scale, <laughs> which, is a, which is a problem when you switch your slides to widescreen, I imagine. When we're looking at uh, scientific papers and clinical trials, um, we tend to worship a false god. Most of us who've done research methods will remember the p-value. And most of us, the thing that we'll look for when we look at a trial and it compares two treatments is was that p-value less than 0.05? But there's a big problem with that. That doesn't represent the clinical effectiveness of the treatment at all. That's simply an index of whether any difference we're seeing has occurred by chance alone. And statisticians are coming to the conclusion that it's a very poor index of that, even. But it doesn't tell us anything about whether that treatment is really delivering benefits regularly that would mean something to patients, that would be important and represent an important improvement to patients. For that, we actually need to look at the effect size. Now, there's been a lot of work done over the years about what would represent a meaningful effect of a treatment for patients with persistent pain? It's phenomenal, though, that a recent systematic review of those studies found that very few of them actually involve patients in that process, which is just frankly horrific, but again represents some of the cultural challenges of academia, I think. Um, the ideal measure of clinically important difference would be first that it shifts our focus away from the p-value, which isn't awfully important. And it shifts our focus to that size of effect. That it's specific to the intervention that's being delivered, and it weighs in the risks of that, bent, that intervention, the costs of that intervention, the inconvenience of engaging with that intervention, as well as the potential benefit. An ideal clinically important difference would be specific to the population, specific to the patients with that condition and would represent their needs, and would be derived from, from their input. And it would also be based on a measurement of actual treatment effect, and not just patient outcome. One of the fundamental principles of evidence-based practice is the outcome a patient has does not necessarily represent a treatment effect.
So uh, in about 2008, the Impact Consensus Group, a bunch of academics and clinicians in chronic pain, came together and decided, well, let's set some thresholds for minimal clinically important improvement. And they came up with these thresholds, so less than 10 to 15% would really not represent an important change. Greater than 10 to 15% would be our threshold for minimally important change. Greater than 30% uh, moderately important change. And greater than 50% substantially important change. Can anyone see a problem with these, potentially? I mean, they're, they're entirely generic, right? They don't factor in the cost of the treatment, the risks of the treatment. They were derived by benchmarking against patients' sort of global perceived benefit scores. So they are actually derived from data that comes from patients, but they're ultimately generic. Now, the other problem is they're not a measure of treatment effect. They're a measure of treatment outcome or the outcome uh, from baseline to follow-up. And the outcome from baseline to follow-up represents how much that patient would have improved without treatment, the natural history of the condition. It represents all the non-specific treatment effects, which are more or less important depending on what treatment it is that we're measuring. And then possibly, but not always, they will represent an actual specific effect of the treatment. So while they tell us about whether the change of patient experiences might meet a threshold of importance, they're not based on a measure of treatment effect. The direct measure of treatment effect that we get from clinical trials is the difference after the treatment between the two groups, the group that got the treatment and the control. That's the, the output of interest from a clinical trial. So the OMERACT group, which is a group of musculoskeletal and rheumatology, uh, rheumatology clinicians and academic, decided, well, what would a minimal clinically important difference look like uh, based on the between group difference? And they came up with the minimal important difference is greater than one point change on a 0 to 10 visual analog scale. So one point. Now, does that surprise people at all? Because it surprised me when I went into clinical research how small effect sizes often are um, based on the between group difference. They then caution that we shouldn't dismiss effects of less than one point on a 0 to 10 pain scale as not important. So they're sort of couching it in caveats. And it kind of begs the question, how low can we go with this, right? And what's driving this, this, this acceptance of small effect sizes as important? Is that coming from patients, do you think? Or is that coming from a more pragmatic uh, way of dealing with what we've got? So what I did was I went to the Cochrane Library, which is a repository of systematic reviews of clinical trials, and I was a bit of a cheat. I cherry-picked comparisons for chronic back pain. I cherry-picked the best ones. So I haven't put in the dross and the ones that didn't show an effect. I found the best comparisons I could from up-to-date systematic reviews in the Cochrane Library of the between-group difference and plotted them against our 0 to 10 pain scale. So here we have Pilates versus sort of a minimal care. Here we have multidisciplinary biopsychosocial rehabilitation programs, so you're quite, usually quite intensive uh, chronic pain management programs. Here we have tramadol versus placebo. Does that surprise anyone? That's the amazing thing about the opioid crisis is that for chronic pain, opioids are appallingly bad painkillers. Right? So we're using them because everyone thinks opioids are strong, and they are, but not strong at helping people. Strong opioids versus placebo. This is manual therapy versus another treatment. You might think I've been hard on manual therapy. The reason I didn't choose the sham comparison is that one wasn't statistically significant. So I was trying to be kind. Um, and this one is CBT versus a waiting list control. And the point of that is we can see that actually there's not a great deal of difference between all these interventions. These interventions are all delivering statistically significant change, but there are definite questions to be asked about the clinical importance of that change on evidence. So we're suffering from a tyranny of small effects. And it's hard to know what's in that little small effect. It could be in that trial, because what we're looking at is averages between groups, it could be that most people experience a small effect, that that small effect is basically what we might expect when we deliver this treatment to this group. It could be that a very small minority of people experience really large effects. This is the best case scenario, really. 
Um, but uh, lots of people didn't, and therefore, on average, the effect size is washed out down to a much smaller effect. It could be that a large group of people experience really large benefits, large effects, but another group of almost equal size experience substantial harm. That's an argument that gets less play generally in conferences. And it could be that there's no effects at all in there, and all we're actually measuring is the inherent biases within the evidence base. So it's hard to make sense of that stuff. A colleague of mine at Cochrane has decided, though, that the mean, the average between group difference, is mean. Because when he's looked across uh, pharmacological interventions for persistent pain, he finds that the distribution of outcomes is not normally distributed. So you can see that uh, this is etoicoxib for chronic back pain. Lots of people don't have much benefit at all. Very few people sit in the middle. And then a substantial group experience substantial benefit. The question then is, is that always the case? Are outcomes always distributed like that? Is the mean really not a good measure of effectiveness? So along with a colleague of mine, Steve Camper, we sourced recently data from about 10 years' worth of RCTs of non-pharmacological interventions. Actually, there were a few pharmacological ones in there too. But we found no evidence of this kind of distribution. In fact, the distributions we saw would have suggested that the mean is probably our best estimate of treatment effectiveness. When we look at the drug data, because it's that bimodally distributed, we can represent it in a different way. We can just, instead of measuring pain scores on average, we can just count the number of people who had a clinically important improvement, say a 50% improvement. And from that, you can calculate the number needed to treat, which is a funky statistic that basically tells me how many more people would I need to treat with this drug instead of placebo for one more person to experience a 50% improvement in pain. So these are up-to-date data on that. So pregabalin, I'd have to treat the best part of eight more people with pregabalin than placebo for just one more person to experience a 50% improvement in their neuropathic pain. Does that surprise anyone? So that's Lyrica. Antidepressants, tricyclics like amitriptyline, do a bit better. Uh, strong op opioids do a bit better, but of course, the harms associated with strong opioids we're all fully aware of. But what these data tell us is none of our drugs are as effective as we think they are. And that sort of led Andrew Moore to suggest that maybe when we're delivering pharmacological interventions for people with persistent pain, we should expect failure. Actually, these data strongly suggest we should expect failure, but pursue success. Now, if that sounds a bit nihilistic, it's not. Because if we think that the most likely outcome of delivering a new drug is failure, then we can monitor very closely for that failure because response, when it comes, comes quickly. And that means that when we identify failure early, we can stop with that drug. And that means we can minimize the potential harms of being on any of those agents. Move to the next one. Move to the next one. Now, there's an argument out there that maybe that's what we should be doing in the world of rehab. And I get that to some extent, but I think the danger is it just means we push patients through this endless smorgasbord of marginal or ineffective treatments. So I think there's a danger in that. Now, clinical trials definitely aren't for everyone, right? And I know, being someone who goes to present our Cochrane reviews around the world, that Cochrane reviews have this tendency just to aggravate people. <laughs> and I get that, right? I get that because they often tell us difficult truths. And there is still a very strong body of opinion in rehab circles, probably based on the fact that trials haven't always been very kind to us, that clinical trials just really don't reflect how great we are, that clinical trials are just not a great method. And the primary argument, when you boil it down, the one that you'll hear most commonly, maybe not at the stage, but definitely in the bar, is that I just know it works. I've seen it work. And from a scientific perspective, the only real response to that <laughs> is an infinite face palm. Because you can't possibly know. Because symptoms change, and people get better, and people get worse, and it's very hard to define your effect within that. But there are some better arguments, potentially, against clinical trials. The first one is 
Well, your clinical trial applied a one-size-fits-all approach, and that's not how I practice. I tailor my treatments to the individual in front of me, and I absolutely understand that. But you need to be careful that you're not using that as a reflex argument against clinical trials, many of which do tailor interventions. So a really good example of that was uh, the PROMISE trial for whiplash developed by the University of Queensland. So in the UQ, you know, they have some real thought leaders in what neck pain is about and how you treat whiplash. They developed a fantastically complex multimodal intervention. It had exercise advice, education, CBT. It really took account of potential PTSD symptoms. It had manual therapy. It had all of these things. It really spent time training the clinicians in that trial to deliver it, and the clinicians could individualize that treatment as much as they wanted. So it was just taking a best practice model of care based on our best theory, training clinicians just to tailor that to the patient in front of them. For me, it's a trial of best practice in whiplash, not one size fits all, and they compared it to a single session and a leaflet of exercises, and there was no difference on any primary outcome. Now, when that got published, I blogged it, and the immediate response, probably within 30 seconds of publishing the blog, was someone saying, one size does not fit all. But it's a nonsense argument in that context. There are plenty of clinical trials that do fall into the one, sits all, one size fits all, but you shouldn't assume it until you've read the trial and tried to make sense of what it's doing. Sometimes our best intentions and interventions are going to fail. A good idea and biological plausibility does not guarantee a good outcome. The next argument that you'll hear a lot of clinical trials is the subgroup argument. You know, and it kind of follows from the one size doesn't fit all argument. That yeah, we didn't see much overall, but there might be a subgroup of people for whom this treatment really works. That's entirely reasonable. But if you think that there are subgroups of people, maybe you should do your RCT in that subgroup of people who would respond. If you think there might be a specific subgroup of people who respond to the treatment, maybe you could build in a priori a robust analysis for that. But what it often boils down to is people getting the data at the end, going hunting for people who got better, and trying to find out what characterized them. And there's a really great example from the world of cardiac uh, medicine, where a bunch of statisticians, just for fun and to annoy the field, started running through some subgroup analysis, and they could show that one heart drug was specifically effective in people born under the star sign Sagittarius. Because there's an old aphorism which I don't take credit for, and I can't tell you who said it. I, I, someone told me who originally said it. But if you talk to your data long enough, it will confess to something, right? <laughs> The last argument, and again, this one I think will, will really get to the heart of most of us, is that you know, the real world is really complex. So maybe you're not capturing that outcome in your clinical trial, but that's because the world is complex, and so it gets washed out in the noise. And I find that a very difficult argument to come to terms with, because none of us deliver treatment in a soundproof room, right? We deliver treatments within that noise of the world, in people with persistent pain, who often who have profoundly complicated and noisy lives. The challenge for any intervention is to reliably deliver benefit for patients within the noise of that. And if we were trying to control the noise out in our trials, then we're really not producing trials that give us evidence that we can use. When we go into that complexity, think about the complexity that you're dealing with when you have any patient sat in front of you the first time. There's the complexity of the individual, and that's a kind of infinite complexity. And you're never going to know that individual completely and everything that's driving what's happening to them. There's the complexity of whatever condition is driving their symptoms. The complexity of what's going to happen to that patient if you do nothing, which you can't possibly really predict. Well, not, certainly not reliably. There's the complexity of the environment that they're in, their social and domestic environment. There's the complexity of the intervention itself, say CBT or an exercise program. Is it delivered with fidelity? Do you have that therapist-patient interaction? And then there's the complexity of events, things that just happen. Shit happens, right? And that can't be predicted, but will affect outcome. And the problem with each of these is each of these is an onion, right? Each of these is an onion with infinite layers that interact. And while absolutely it's part of the clinical skill set to try and derive and divine the truth 
within all that complexity. It's not possible to do it reliably. In fact, the controlled clinical trial was designed as a method for trying to cut through that complexity to detect the signal in the noise. Trying to derive a narrative from that complexity is easy, but you might get to the truth or you might be doing the equivalent of seeing the face of Elvis on a slice of toast, right? That it's very easy to develop, to develop narratives that appear truthful, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are truthful. And another kind of uncomfortable truth that we don't hear much of is that the majority of RCTs of interventions in rehab contain biases that broadly favor the therapy under investigation, as we saw in one of my first slides. This is the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool, and it's really just for the nerds, but I think you're probably all nerds. And each of these things represents a characteristic of a clinical trial. This is basically a list of ways you can design a trial to get the wrong answer, right? So when we uh, do systematic reviews of clinical trials, each of, a, each of those trials, we will assess their methods against each of these criteria. Did they randomize properly? Did they protect that randomization? Did they blind uh, participants? Could they blind the outcome assessors? Did they deal with missing data in an appropriate fashion? Have they reported all the outcomes they said they would, or are they just reporting the ones they want you to see? This is uh, it's absolutely well known and well demonstrated that studies that fail on any of these criteria will return an effect size bigger, on average, than studies that don't. So all of these biases make our treatments look better than they actually are. And that's kind of, that, that's established. You guys all should know this, or you should use this tool when you're reading a trial, or maybe the Pedro tool, just to run through the list, man, because it's a very quick uh, checklist for helping you to make sense of whether you should trust that trial or file it in the bin. But I want to talk to you about some of the other challenges that don't make this list. Challenges that are a bit more infrastructural in the evidence base that I think you need to be aware of to be a good user of evidence. And the first of these is that size matters. And anyone who tries to tell you that size doesn't matter has a hidden agenda, right? Size of trials matters. Most of you who did statistics at your undergrad level will know that a small trial is underpowered to detect an effect. So small trials should be at risk of false negatives, of not finding a treatment is effective, even though it is. But there's a paradox here. Small trials that actually get published are more likely to demonstrate a much bigger effect than bigger trials. And the question is, why would that be? Because if they're underpowered, they should be false negatives. But the ones that make it into print tend to be much more optimistic than larger, better trials. And the first reason for that is this, it's publication bias, that small trials are easy to hide. So small trials that don't demonstrate a benefit for the treatment just tend not to make it into print. They're selectively filtered out of the peer review process. Now partly that might be because a very enthusiastic clinical researcher who was very vested in the treatment was very disappointed in the result, so they just filed the trial in the drawer next to their desk. But partly it might be because they tried to publish it, but it got a really hard time at peer review because the peer reviewers had a vested interest, perhaps in that treatment being shown to be effective or not ineffective. Or it might just be that it got past the peer reviewers, but the editor thought negative trials aren't sexy and they're not going to get people reading my journal. Right? But publication bias is a serious infrastructural problem. This is a great example of it. This is a funnel plot, which is, again, another nerdy thing from, from, from systematic reviews. And this is glucosamine for osteoarthritis. And this always interests me because back in the day, years ago, when I had a rugby injury, I started taking glucosamine because the evidence looked kind of promising, right? I don't take it now. Um, so this is a systematic review of glucosamine trials. And what you'll see here is the effect size is reflected down the bottom in units of standard deviation. So what we want to see is negative numbers because that means less pain, okay? And this dashed line here represents the average effect across all the trials they found of glucosamine versus placebo. So what we would expect to see if there's no publication bias is the big trials, which are really precise, cluster really close to that average treatment effect, 
And as the trials get smaller, because small trials are very imprecise, they're going to spread out either side of the effect in a kind of funnel. But what we often see is one side of the funnel goes missing. right? So these empty spaces here should have a bunch of blobs just like this one, but they don't. And what that implies, it's not absolute proof, but it is a hint, it is, it is exploratory evidence that there is publication bias going on here. Because the big trials are getting published and the small negative trials aren't. But the small trials that really punch an effect size, they're making it into print. What's even more interesting about this is, you see the red squares, they're all trials from one manufacturer, which is Rotter Farm. And the, the, the red diamonds, they're everyone else. Can you see a, a thing here? Because they're all testing the same, the same compound, right? Look at that. This is the most extreme funnel plot I've ever seen. And what it shows you is small trials of Rotter Farm that are really effective, show that it's really effective, are over here. They're getting published. But there's a big gap over here, and it's specific to one manufacturer. Now, this systematic review said that most of the heterogeneity in glucosamine trials is explained by brand. Trials using the Rotterfarm Madhouse product have a superior outcome. But that systematically fails to acknowledge that we can explain that because small studies that don't show an effect aren't getting published. This average here is derived from all these trials. So if we threw in three or four on the other side of the funnel, how effective do you think glucosamine would be compared to placebo? Not at all. Not at all. So publication bias is something to be aware of. The next thing is our, com our interventions aren't generally pharmacological. They're complicated, right? So CBT or exercise or multimodal pain management, these are complicated, multifaceted interventions, lots of little details, lots of different ways different components can interact, lots of potential problems with delivering them with fidelity, lots of potential problems with patient engagement and adherence. One of the things that you guys need as users of evidence, and I need as a researcher, is that intervention is described properly. I know what they did, why they did it, what was the theory driving that, what was the dose, how well trained were people, how was it tailored, all that information. It should be a given, shouldn't it, that we should be able to replicate the intervention that was delivered. But Tammy Hoffman, who's a fantastic clinical researcher in Australia, did a systematic review of non-pharmacological interventions and found that only 39% were adequately described. And they concluded that that missing information is a frequent remedial contributor to research waste. Fine, you can say this trial shows me that CBT is effective, but what was CBT in that trial? Could you implement it from that trial report? And that's a problem. And that means our interventions are kind of like black boxes sometimes in these trials. And it sort of leads to reductionist thinking about what's going on. Now, there is recognition of that. We have a range of reporting guidelines of best practice that people are supposed to adhere to. The Equator Network really is a repository of all these different uh, guidelines, like the Consort Statement for Trials and the Prisma Statement for Systematic Reviews. They're, those checklists are open access. So if you're reading a trial or review, why not get it next to you and tick down if you can get all the information you need from it. And they've generated this new checklist called the Tidier Checklist, which is about making sure that all that information about the intervention itself is present in the trial report somewhere. And most physical therapy journals are signing up to make Tidier as a checklist a mandatory requirement of trials before they'll be accepted for publication. So things are moving forward. Things are improving. There's a lot of misreporting in the scientific literature. Uh, a systematic review found discrepancies between the trial protocol, which is a document that says, what do we think we're going to do in this trial? What are we, going, what are we planning to do? And the actual published trial report. 30% of those were unambiguous. And what that means is clear examples of cheating. Right? They were unambiguous. Things like not reporting the primary outcome that you registered in your protocol. Why do you think you wouldn't report your primary outcome? That doesn't happen at random, right? You don't report it because you didn't find the effect that you wanted on your primary outcome. So what you might do is just switch it out to one of the secondary outcomes that you might have found something on. And that happens 
far too often. Outside of pharmacology, we're really bad at acknowledging our potential to harm people. So a uh, systematic review of adverse event reporting for non-pharmacological trials found that less than 59% reported how they assessed adverse events. Only a third reported who withdrew due to adverse events from each study arm, and only a quarter reported all adverse events. That is just fundamentally unacceptable, because if we're going to put ourselves in a position of claiming that we can help people, we need to acknowledge that sometimes we might harm them, right? And the fact that our trials aren't even reporting that they measured harm represents a systematic disservice to the patient community. And then, even when uh, a study is performed well and reported well in terms of its methods, researchers seem to have a really hard time in accepting that they didn't find an effect. So Isabel Boutron, who's an Oxford-based researcher, did a fantastic study where they went looking for spin in published trial reports. And basically by spin, they meant the main analysis didn't show any effect, but in the abstract, they start trying to find you reasons why there's actually a more positive story than that. And they, they had a checklist of things that they would consider to be examples of spin and went hunting for it. Um, they found spin in more than one section of negative RCT reports. So they looked specifically at trials that didn't show a benefit on the primary outcome, and they found spin in 40% of those. Another group looked at rheumatology RCTs and found misleading conclusions in the abstract of 23%. They then looked at what predicted the chance of a misleading outcome. And the, the thing that strongly predicted a misleading outcome was not finding an effect on the primary outcome. And recently in analgesic trials, Jennifer Gawantner's group found spin in the abstract of 61% of negative analgesic trials. So for those of you who only ever read the abstract, buyer beware, you might be missing something important. And it makes me think about, you know, what are we trying to do with science? You know, according to Karl Popper, we're supposed to be generating our hypotheses about what might work, and then going to extreme lengths to try and disprove those hypotheses. And then if they stand, after we've taken all efforts to disprove them, well then we'll accept them as true. But it seems to me, when you look at this spin and misreporting, that a lot of scientific reports are more like those memes you see on Facebook that are supposed to make you feel a bit better about everything, but are actually ultimately meaningless. You know the kind of thing. They've got a sunset, something about live the change you want to be, maybe a unicorn or something like that, right? And, uh, you know, that's not science, you know. We need to be embracing the negative a little bit more. One last kind of big problem is this, and I've put this slide in there specifically for Corey Blick and staff, um, and that is, that is predatory publishers. Are you aware of this as a phenomena? So I get about five emails a day from journals I didn't know existed, often on topics I have nothing to do with, asking me to publish and pay to publish my, my paper in a journal. And if I pay, it will get peer-reviewed, but it probably won't. I pay them money, I get a paper published. It's massively polluting the data pool. My favorite such email was this one, addressed to Dear Dr. Default Value. <laughs> I, I, I hope you're doing well. Um, but the problem with that is, as a, as a user of evidence, how do you know which journals are legit and which ones aren't? And it's actually a gray area because some predatory journals are starting to become accepted. Whether they should or not is another thing. In one day, I got one invitation from an obesity journal and one invitation from a hair loss journal, and I thought they were profiling me, you know? <laughs> but, uh, but anyway. Um, so I just want to go through a little rogues gallery of things that you can look for that aren't on the risk of bias checklist, but they're definitely signs that something is not going well in the trial you're reading. The first one is you compare two treatments, and in our workshop we saw some examples of this. You might compare dry needling with, with manual therapy or something like that. Uh, there's no difference between the two groups, so the authors conclude, usually in the abstract, that both treatments worked. That's a logical fallacy because you didn't compare those treatments with not doing something or a sham. That is very, very common. It is a, it's a, just a basic failure of scientific reasoning. The surrogate outcome gamble. When you've got a trial, it's worth, just for the fun of it, digging out the trial register report. You can search clinicaltrials.gov or the protocol and see what they said they would measure as a primary outcome. Because sometimes, you know, I can't find an effect on back pain, 
But the transversus abdominal muscle, well, that activated about 10 milliseconds earlier in the, in the active treatment group, so our treatment worked. But that's just not true. Um, post hoc subgroup hunting, I've talked about that already. Going hunting after the fact to try and find things that characterize the people who did well. But that's a very dangerous business that's most likely to give you the wrong answer. P hacking is a case of running as many statistical tests as you can until one comes up as statistically significant, and then you can claim that something you had some benefit. But if you think P equals less than 0.05 is a 5% false positive risk, well, if you, and it's not really, statisticians would kill me for saying that, but if we take that as the sort of basic understanding of a p-value, if you run that t-test 10 times and one of them comes up at p equals less than 0.05, well, you had a 50% chance of a false positive, and that's cheating. And then the other one is axis cropping. It doesn't happen so much, but you're going to have such fun if you find it. Here's an example of a trial that we peer-reviewed of brain stimulation versus placebo for chronic pain in fibromyalgia. The outcome is pain. Uh, you can see some statistically significant differences going on here. Anything wrong with this, this study, this graph? What do you normally measure pain on? A 0 to 10 scale. And so did they. But they, you know, obviously they must have worried about fitting a 0 to 10 scale on the page because they've cropped it to a two and a half point scale, a quarter of that scale. So we said, well, you know, we, we think this is a good trial, but could you fix your graph? So this is the published version of the same data. And again, it's just about making it look bigger. It's another form of spin that's worth looking out for. I know I'm getting a bit tight for time. Um, so I was asked at a recent conference, what would be revolutionary to fix this? Actually, it's not particularly revolutionary. It would be revolutionary if we stopped using p-values as a marker of success. It would be revolutionary if risks of bias that can be controlled for were controlled. If we consistently stuck to our own rules. If we reported our trials to contemporary standards. If we were actually consistently cautious in interpreting our data. And if trials were consistently published irrespective of their results. And the problem with this is, as a user of evidence or a patient, you can feel like you're trapped in a maze. It's overwhelming, isn't it? And it can make you feel a little bit like, you know, well, if it's, if it's like that, if it's like that, I don't know if I can really, I don't know if I can really engage with this. Why should I? And so the answer then, if you feel lost, is just to defer responsibility, right? You can defer responsibility to gurus. We're historically really good at that, or now research gurus. We can defer responsibility to bloggers who will shout angrily at what the truth is, whether it's the truth or not. We can defer responsibility to the Twitterati. We might choose, I would argue, but I have vested interest here, rather, rather more reliable sources like Cochrane or clinical guideline producers to give us better answers. But all of those are potentially fallible. And the one thing I would like, I think this is all about power. And the power is based on people's understanding. If we as a community increased our research literacy, this wouldn't be allowed to happen. And the reason it can happen is because no one wants to ask the difficult questions and most people don't feel like they have the tools to really attack it and spot it. So oh, I'm really running time. Can I go five minutes over? Thanks. Quick honesty test, and I want you to be honest because we're all friends here and it won't leave the room. When you read a paper, what bit do you read? Put your hand up if you read the abstract. Keep your hand up if you read all of the abstract. <laughs> Put your hand up if you read the introduction. Uh, about half. The discussion and conclusions. Put your hand up if you read in detail the methods. Whoa. What about the results? What about the results including all the numbers? Uh, all right, so less than half. Interestingly, the only bits of the paper you really need to read are the methods and the results. Everything else is just fluff, really. And, you know, it's really not as hard as it seems. It feels overwhelming, but it's not. And I would love you guys to get better at this because, like I say, it balances the power, right? So all you've got to do for any paper is ask yourself this. It's Basic Research Methods 101. Is this an appropriate design to answer this kind of question? So if we're asking about effectiveness, for me at least, it's a clinical trial. Within that, is it actually done, of, is it of good quality? Have they controlled for avoidable biases? So you could use the Cochrane tool for that. 
or a CASP tool, which I'll come on to in a second. And then you've got to ask beyond that, that's just about do you trust the results? Do they actually mean anything for the people you're trying to make decisions with, right? Is there external validity? And is the effect size big enough for you to care? And you can boil that down to, is the patient group really similar enough? Is the intervention appropriate? Is it achievable? Would it be acceptable to the people you're trying to make decisions about? Are the outcomes genuinely patient-centered, or do they represent the interests of the industry rather than the patient? If it's the industry, chuck it in the bin. You don't need to read that anymore. How big is the effect? Would you really predict that it would make a difference to patients? And do I even have enough information, which is a big problem. If you're reading a paper and you can't tell if it's good or not, it's not good. Put it in the bin. Don't waste your time. Life's too short. But perfection is a myth. There are no perfect studies. Research is really hard to do. You could design the perfect study, but life gets in the way. People do strange things. So what I would say to you when you're reading a paper is recognize how hard research is. Have pity with the researcher. Be kind about it. Don't just give the paper a kicking, but be objective. You're not on your own with this, right? There are loads of tools that you can use to get better at this. The CAST tool, which is open access online in Oxford, which is a, they have a tool for every design, qualitative, cross-sectional, cohort, RCTs. The guys in our workshop have been using those and finding them really useful. And it asks you all along the way, is it worth continuing or shall I put this paper down now? Right? Students for Best Evidence is a fantastic blog basically outlining in an understandable form basic principles of clinical research. Pedro have their checklist and also tutorials on how to uh, critique a trial on their website. And this paper here in Evidence-Based Medicine this month is just a magnificent piece uh, of, of, of explanatory literature. And the biggest problem with all of this, the biggest barrier for you doing this well is you. Right? Because you don't come at this from a value-neutral perspective. Every paper you read, you're reading for a reason. You have an answer that you want to get. So things you might do, and by might, what I mean is will, is you'll cherry-pick just the papers that you, you want because they're the ones that give you the answer you want. You'll just ignore the research that doesn't give you the answer you want. You'll selectively criticize papers that don't give you the answer you want. Right? That's called rescue bias. You'll find things that are wrong with it because you don't like the answer. Or you'll just ignore research and you'll wallow in your comfortable truths of life. And we're all going to do that from time to time. But if you're aware of it, right, then you can check against it. And you can say, well, I'm not going to do that. But whenever you pick up a paper, do this for me. Right? It's before you look at it, beyond the title, ask yourself, what are my biases? Am I prepared to be fair? Am I genuinely prepared to hear any answer? And if you're not, put it in the bin, go and have a cup of tea. Because if you're doing that and you're not in a position of being fair, you will only get to evidence-based practice by accident, right? And that's a dodgy business. Put it in the bin. Or as Richard Feynman once said, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. So what I think would be revolutionary is this. When you as users of evidence are going to look at a piece of paper. When asking your questions, be prepared for any answer. I think it would be revolutionary if, as a clinical community, we all developed our research literacy and our critical thinking skills. I think it would be revolutionary if we chose our authorities more wisely, and even when we choose them, we still question them and scrutinize them. And it would be really revolutionary if we stopped cherry-picking links from PubMed of papers we've never read in order to make an argument. And we've all done it, right? We've all done it. It can feel that this is just relentless negativity, this focus on bias and control and, and, uh, and sort of questioning whether things work. But for me, it's more like due diligence, right? It's about genuinely asking ourselves the difficult questions. It's about recognizing that what's good for our profession is not the same thing necessarily as what's good for patients. And in the end, what's going to be good for patients is if we get closer to the truth of things. Or as Feynman once said, if we think about all our treatments as a health technology, for a successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. Don't be miserable. Turn that frown upside down. Things are getting better. We're having this conversation. 
People are engaging in this stuff. Twitter and social media have really upped the ante in terms of how much evidence is actually presented. And there are some fantastic government-funded research groups in Australia, in America, in the UK, and elsewhere, getting big money to deliver the sorts of trials that previously were only possible for the industry, for the pharmaceutical industry. Things are getting better. But if you guys hold up your end of that and work at this and hold researchers to account, then things get better still. Archie Cochran, this is my last slide, the inspiration for the Cochran uh, uh, collaboration once wrote this. One should be delightfully surprised when any treatment at all is effective and always assume that a treatment is ineffective unless there is evidence to the contrary. Now, that might sound nihilistic, but it's not. It's incredibly difficult to change the natural course of someone's health. And we sometimes think in the rehab profession that a bright idea is enough to do that. That's one of the, fundamentally, the problems with the history of our professions, I think, is that we didn't do due diligence on our ideas, first of all. And I think if we all just took a moment to imprint that or maybe tattoo it on your hand, then that would probably be the most revolutionary thing that we could do of all. I want to thank you very much for listening. In terms of recommended reading, this paper in physical therapy from a few years ago basically is a summary of most of what I've said. This key concepts for informed health choices is also a fantastic resource. Thank you so much for being a lovely audience. Thanks for inviting me. So we're going to have a little bit of time to uh, take questions. It is 10:19, so we're going to be going. We're going to go till about 10:30. And so if you have a question, please raise a hand, and we'll get a microphone to you as quickly as possible. If we have questions coming in uh, from folks that are streaming the event online, uh, please let me know. I do need a microphone right over here towards the front on the right side. And then we've got another question in the back row after that. Neil, thank you so much for your presentation today. Oh, I felt like I just relived the, your two-day seminar in about 45 minutes. Yeah. Uh, and, and oddly, I'm, I, I think more of this will stick for me. That's great. So let's take a look and see what our question is here. Hi. Thank Hi, you so medicine. much for that fantastic talk. Um, I have a question in terms of uh, supplementary material in that uh, it's something that I often ignore and I've been delving into it more recently and they often hide a lot of uh, interesting data in there that they never mention in the paper. So how, what is your attitude about uh, trying to take advantage of supplementary material whenever you're reading a paper? I think uh, that's a really great question. I think supplementary material is a fantastic thing because now we have, most things are published online. There's not the issue of word count so much. So people can put all the available information. But people cheat and they abuse it and they hide stuff that should be in the paper, headline stuff, in the supplementary information. The solution for you guys or everyone else is read the supplementary information. We were critiquing a systematic review in our workshop uh, and it was a systematic review of treatments for tennis elbow. And the main meta-analysis, rather than being a meta-analysis of treatment effect, was a meta-analysis of how much people change from baseline, which is completely not the right analysis. And that was the only analysis presented in the paper. And they presented the actual analysis that could tell us whether the treatment worked or not in the supplementary information, which interestingly, no one in the workshop had looked, uh, checked. So they do absolutely squirrel it away. I think, you know, without being a nihilist, I don't think you should ever assume good practice. My view of papers is it's actually quite fun to be a detective, right? To assume that something might be hiding and go looking for it. And if you can't find it, then you give the benefit of the doubt. That would be my view. Great, thank you. The next question is in the very back of the room. Again, anybody that has a, a, a questions, please let, me, please let me know by raising your hand. I, I just wanted to know your thoughts on pre-registered, I'm back here, sorry, uh, on pre-registered trials uh, and just your thoughts on it and why we don't use them more or maybe we shouldn't be using them. Well, as in registering the trial protocol beforehand? Well, I would say that the vast majority of trials would now make it to a register but they wouldn't necessarily publish a detailed protocol and registers are quite inconsistent in what they report and they're often not updated and a bit like ethics committees 
there's never really a system of audit to make sure people are actually keeping honest. So often I think researchers fall into the trap of registering their trial, but they never go back and tell us what they did. So it would be quite rare for me to find a trial now that isn't registered. But the register document doesn't often tell me everything I need to know. So we're moving to a position where the good trial groups will publish a full detailed protocol in a journal like BMJ Open or BMC Musculoskeletal Disorders. If you're reading a trial as a user, I think it's really useful to try and source the protocol and have it next to you. And it might be you don't look at it, but if you think something doesn't seem right, it's very quick just to go back and make sure that the plan is the same as the outcome. And I think what we've seen in the slides is the plan often changes, and that isn't always transparent. It's actually okay to deviate from protocol if you report it and explain why, and it's all very transparent, and we as users can interpret what impact that might have had. The cardinal sin is to change from protocol and tell no one about it. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I guess I was thinking in terms of uh, pre-registering a trial so that it gets published regardless of what the results are. Right, yes. Yeah. And well, I, I don't, you, you might see that more in the UK than, but I, I feel like I don't see it a whole lot here in the US as far as um, registering a trial and then having the confirmation that it will get published as long as you uh, adhere to the methodology, um, but that n regardless of the results, the study gets published. Sure. I mean, uh, I think probably even here, trials get registered, but the, where the big problem is, is they don't get published afterwards, right? Exactly. And, and you know, that's, the trial registry was a great idea, but the follow through on it hasn't been fantastic. I don't know if you're aware of the All Trials campaign that's been spearheaded by Ben Goldacre, but that's a campaign to try and make sure that everything gets published. It's, it's an ongoing tension. It's a big problem. Absolutely. Do you see it in academia? I, I'm in academia as well, and the, the need for folks in academia to publish and the uh, pressure to publish poor trial, you know, just to get yeah. something out there because you have to produce scholarship. Well, I'm subject to it, yeah. I mean, I, th I think uh, there are all sorts of perverse incentives in academia that encourage bad practice, and, and, and publish or perish is one of them. You know, but um, as, as researchers, we've got to try and resist that. And, and that's, that's hard if you want a promotion sometimes. We had another question, not the second row, though I know yeah. you're next. Thanks. Um, I had a bit of a question. Effect size eludes me all the time in terms of when I'm reading the research. So I'm hoping that you might be able to take a moment and just kind of boil it down to brass tacks in terms of how you can interpret effect size. Yeah, that's, that's kind of hard. I mean, it depends on the outcome. So, so on the, I've got a, like a one hour lecture on it. <laughs> but um, I, I think it depends. If it's a pain score uh, in a single trial, then it should be the between group difference on that pain score. So if it was two, then it would mean that on average, pain scores after treatment were two points better in one group than the other. And you need the 95% confidence intervals around that to get an idea of the precision. But if it's a dichotomous outcome, like did they respond to treatment or not, then you would use the risk ratio and from, and that you, or the risk difference, and from that you can get the number needed to treat. My view is that the number needed to treat is quite intuitive. I would need to treat this many more people than the comparison treatment, with this treatment compared to the comparison for one more person to experience a treatment response. So if you have someone, a trial that uses a responder analysis, they should be presenting that data with the confidence intervals. It gets harder with systematic reviews where they pull a number of studies together that measured the same construct like pain or depression, but they all use different scales with different scoring properties. And what they do then is they use the standardized mean difference. And that's not the same thing as the mean difference on a pain scale. The standardized mean difference normalizes each study in units of standard deviations. So if you see a standardized mean difference of one, that means, on average, the treatment group were one standard deviation better than the control group. But that's kind of meaningless, unless you go back to the data and say, well, how big was the standard deviation on the original scale? So, so SMD is a useful tool, but it's very hard to interpret. I, I mean, I, I, but I'd be more than happy to chat with you about it afterwards, but it's, it's a long conversation. We have a gentleman near the front here. <laughs> 
Hi, uh, I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to reading your paper on bimodal distributions because that's something that I've been thinking about a lot with people uh, outlier kind of respond high responders, low responders. Sure. Uh, my question is around study design and we're inherently dealing with, like you say, complexity in biology. And so we have some problems with comparing A with A plus B. Yep. design, so yep. general exercise versus general exercise plus dry needling, say, because the people in the A plus B design get more yep. intervention. Yep. Uh, and so I, I just wonder, like, how do... And we don't even really have anything that is best practice currently because everything works about the same as everything else. <laughs> so... Or not. Yeah. So what, what are your thoughts on... Uh, a, the optimal kind of study design and how to evaluate study design when we're, when we're reading something? Uh, it, it's very dependent on the question. I mean, I don't think there's, a, there's no value in an A versus A plus B design, but as you say, the problem is the imbalance of attention. But if you just want to pragmatically ask the question, does delivering these two treatments deliver more benefit than just the one, and you're not worried about how that happens, then there's no problem with that. If you're wanting to control for that imbalance of attention, then you've really got to throw in some kind of inert balance for that attention. Um, and that can be hard to do. With, with needling, it's not so hard because there are ways of sham controlling for that. Um, but, you know, if, if, if it's CBT, I mean, some studies have tried to do you know, placebo CBT, and it basically consists of a chat and a cup of tea. And you think, well, you know, how, how credible is that? Another study, you know, sham manual therapy is just getting someone who looks authoritative just to put a hand on the back. And, and for me, that wouldn't be as credible as someone, you know, twisting and clicking and crunching me. So it, it's, it's hard, and there are limitations to what you can get. If you're interested in pragmatic questions, it doesn't matter so much. But if you want to get to the why, it absolutely does. I don't think there is an optimal design. I think it just depends on, you know, you choose a design that fits the question. In the same sense that I've talked about RCTs today, but I really want to make the point that they're not the only useful source of evidence. They're by far the best source of evidence to get on average is our treatment delivering benefit. But they're not the be all and end all of evidence-based practice. Um, so I guess in answer to your question, it is tricky. You should pick the best design that gets you closest to, the, to, to interrogating the answer you want. As a user of evidence, you should be aware that they might have used a design that isn't ideal, and they might have done that with an agenda. I don't know if that answers it or not. But. We have, uh, we're coming right up on our time, but uh, we've got one last question from Mike Stewart, mm. and then we will take a break. Hi, Neil, great Hi, talk. Mark. Thanks. Hi, uh, uh, that, that was really good. Uh, what I loved was the fact that you've just highlighted beautifully the complexity of this. It's so complex, isn't it? Um, I, I was wondering about your thoughts on uh, equipping patients with critical appraisal skills. I mean, because what, what I often see in practice is people who, they maybe feel empowered to go it alone and they feel liberated from some of this stuff, and then we see them again three years later because they've read something in the Daily Mail or they've, or they've, you know, they've, they've seen something online. So maybe providing people in pain with some basic appraisal skills to assess yeah. how valid or reliable this information is. I, I think it's a, it's a fabulous idea. I won't hear you attack the Daily Mail, though. It's a fantastic <laughs> newspaper. Of course. Yeah. I didn't say that. That's, that's sarcasm right it's there. It's on um, record. Uh, so, so my view is, yeah, you know, I'm, we're so busy talking to clinicians, but absolutely, we should be talking more to patients. But it can, it can get, get tricky to do that. I think we need to develop very specific resources. Actually, that paper from Chalmers... That's specifically for lay, a lay audience about trying to help people to make informed, right. and it, uh, it, informed health choices and how to spot bullshit, essentially, and spin and all those other things. But, you know, you're basically spitting into a very strong wind, yeah. aren't you? You know, because you've got this much voice and not the power of the mass media and, and the newspaper and, and, the, and the, the, you know, the, the mainstream media have their voice. And it's, it's very hard to not be drowned out by that. But my view on that is you just keep plugging away. I'd love the idea of trying to organize critical appraisal workshops for patient groups, though. I think yeah. it would be a fabulous thing yeah. to do. I think the hard part, though, again, would be convincing people that it was something that they needed. That's and that's hard to convince clinicians, too, of. Yeah. You know? I agree. Thanks very much. Thank you. So I was informed that we do have the we do have just a we do have just a few minutes delay. If somebody has one last pressing question, 
or would you guys like to have those, ex those extra few minutes for uh, whatever you need to do? Because I do have a hand up here in the front that would like to ask one more question. Are you guys okay with that? Okay, one more question. So right up here, second from this end. Thank you. I have a question. I get a few emails about the, from the predatory journals, but I, to your knowledge, are there any of those journals that are actually on PubMed? Yes, no, some are. So, I mean, oh. I'm going to have to be very careful here because, I mean, some publishers that were previously considered predatory. So, a, a, a librarian developed Beale's List, which was a list of predatory publishers, and he's recently had to take it down for legal reasons. Um, and there were definitely publishers that I would have called predatory for a long, long time um, who are now publishing all people I know of you know, and seem to be sort of moving towards at least being accepted in the mainstream. I would be profoundly wary of, of papers in those journals, but maybe I need to open my mind that they, they may have come back into the fold. Um, I wouldn't want to name names because that would be legally probably a dangerous thing to do, but there are certainly a few that are being indexed on PubMed, particularly from the uh, complementary and alternative medicine fields. Okay. No one's approached me about hair loss article though. No, but yeah. that's outrageous, because you, you, like me, look like an expert. 